musical linguistic objects. Help machines. Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And as my virtual co host today, I would like to thank Tyler, Andrew, Joachim, and Michael for buying a copy of my Pay What You Can audiobook, the novel The Genesis Generation. And also a great big thank you again goes out to our frequent donor, Mark C., and who's also a longtime friend of the salon. Also, uh, I'd sure like to thank our fellow saloners who have downloaded a free copy of my novel and helped to spread the word about it to their friends, as well as uh, fellow saloners like Adrian out there on the East Coast, who my friends Chris and Kai tell me is a really big supporter of the salon and passes along the link to these podcasts at every opportunity. And most of all, I want to thank you for being here. You know, my long-enforced hiatus seems to have uh, caused some of our listeners to think that my days with the salon were over, when the truth is that I'm just now getting my second wind and will be with you for the indefinite future. And what an interesting future we seem to be heading into, don't you think? And with that thought, I'd like to introduce today's program featuring a man of many talents and titles, one of which is that of a futurist. As I promised in my last podcast, uh, today I'm going to play something new from one of our favorites here in the salon, my good friend Bruce Damer. In past podcasts, we've heard Bruce talk about elves, egos, and avatars, and uh, about the Evo Grid, which he calls the Ultimate Nerd Project, and also about other topics such as the boundaries of human mind and uh, whether the universe itself is waking up. So how do you top that, I wondered. And then uh, the other day he sent me several hours of an interview that he did with Matt Anderson, who is directing a documentary film series titled Fall and Winter. And uh, he just finished filming on the 15th of this month, and uh, if you want to see a trailer for that film, you can find it at Fall Winter Movie, all one word, fallwintermovie.com. Now, since there are about, uh, I guess, 19 or so other futurists besides Bruce who are featured, It's obvious that not a lot of the several hours of interviews with Bruce will make it into the final cut. And so Matt has very graciously allowed me to play the entire Damer interview for you here in the salon, which I plan to do in several parts. So right now, let's join Bruce Damer and Matt Anderson, who are having a conversation about what Bruce is calling the Great Crescendo. And uh, then I'll be back with some more about uh, a way that you can interact with Bruce in what we hope will grow into a global trialogue. And now, here is Bruce Stamer. What's interesting is the, the, the difference or the, the counterbalance between the dialogue of doom and the voices of hope and the innovators of, of hope for the future. And it's something that you could refer to almost as like a great crescendo. And a crescendo is at the end of a symphony orchestra. It's that last part of the last movement where all the instruments are playing at once. So the cacophonous instruments, the the screaming instruments, are, are, are voices are coming out as well as the harmonious and the hopeful and the highs and the lows. Everything's happening at once. And I think that in this year of, of 2011 and heading into the auspicious year of 2012 and 2013 and beyond, we are in the great crescendo of humanity. And so, and what you're doing in this film is you're actually finding this out. You're finding these voices. You're finding extreme voices and points of view. You're going to hot spots. um, But you're also finding optimistic things for the future and people working on the great projects. And it's, it's a conundrum because it's all happening at the same time. And you say, well, how can all this be happening at the same time? Shouldn't it be just we're all going to hell in a handcart or we're all going into the Jetson future, right? It, shouldn't it be one or the other, one would think. But it, no, it's all these voices at once. And it's the mixture of them that creates the glory that is the human crescendo of uh, the 21st century. Now, what, what in your perspective then happens after an, the orchestra's done? Or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the orchestra. Well, there could be often uh, in, in symphonies you'll, you'll find uh, there's a crescendo that ends a movement, but then there's a, a quiet, serene, pastoral movement that, that follows it. And maybe that's what we're coming into. 
they were coming into the, the big kettle drum phase, you know, afterwards. It really depends on, on in a sense, the, the, the blend of voices in this time period. So, for example, you know, if you watch, you know, the, the extreme news media, whether it be on the right or the left, that are very pessimistic and very doom-seeking, because it, it gets eyeballs, let's face it, and, and, and eardrums. So for them, I mean, you know, the apocalypse is, is around the corner. It's Tuesday afternoon, you know. It's, and if you watch that, you get in, worked up into this fury of uh, a frenzy or fo- you foam out of, you know, madness, um, in a sense. But then you actually walk the streets. If you go to China... And you see that they're putting up all these wind wind farms, and they're deciding that coal is definitely not the best solution to generate cheap power. And they're investing. You go to Hyderabad, India, and you find a place with clean, reworked water systems and incredible transportation. Or Curitiba in Brazil, or or streets in the former Eastern Bloc where people are sure they're they're workaholics now and they're great consumers, but their lives are arguably a lot richer and better than they were. Their diets are better. Um, back where, when I lived in, in Eastern Bloc in, near Prague, uh, the streams, there was no sign of frogs. There hadn't been a, an amphibian seen in, in 40 years because of chemical agriculture, centrally planned farming. And now there's salamanders and frogs again. So you think something on the ground is getting better something is getting better. No matter what is going across the airwaves, something's actually getting better, and it's getting better all over the planet. You know, like South Africa, we, we all watched the World Cup. You know, and what was fantastic, it was this soccer city with this fantastic african design sort of stadium and these streams of hundreds of thousands of people pouring into the stadium and Nelson Mandela showing up and everything. If you'd broadcast those pictures... 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, it was a so different. I mean, here you have this, for the moment, harmonious society. They're a sport-loving society. Nelson's a sport fanatic. He's the president. Now he's the emeritus leader. They've built some of the greatest sporting facilities in the world. The whole world is in South Africa, and everyone's celebrating. What an outcome. I mean, if you went back to 1988, when there were battles in the townships, they would have said, you are mad. That is not our future. Our future is a bloodbath. And it didn't happen. And and all over the world, it's the same thing. The, these these places suddenly become these glowing, you know, developed, uh, you know, of course, there's there's rampant consumerism and there's obesity and all these other things. But on the ground, everything seems to be just creeping forward and getting better. And there are good ideas. And, and, and I think in, in a sense... It's the dialogue, it's the mess, the control of the dialogue that is the problem here. It's, it's the battle of the airways. It's, it's the people we didn't nominate to, to talk back to us and tell us what our culture is and what our future is and what our politics are. and everything. That is the problem. That's the primary problem. So, so how, how do you think that... Um, well, two, two questions then. How do you shield yourself or how do you heal a culture that is in disrepair from that aggression and from that abuse of prodding from from something like the media and, and that sort of thing yeah this yeah this is a tricky this is because it's a form of trauma and so you in a sense uh if we go back to the birth of advertising you know we talked about i, I met some of the people who founded advertising and television in the united states in the late 1940s and these are really seriously um, bad dudes. These were megalomaniacs, egotists. They were nasty to each other. Um, that industry got off to a very bad start with these as their founders, and they continued. And people like Jay Shiat, you know, writing 10, 15 years ago, and one of the great founders of modern advertising, reinventors of advertising, saying advertising steals your future. It it takes away your personalities, it, it critiques and shapes your view of yourself. It is the great one of the greatest destructive forces that has ever been produced by human beings. And you think that especially in, in North America, especially in the United States, if you take apart any commercial on TV, 
it causes often damage. It's it's critical of a group. It's it's it it creates self criticism. It makes you desire things you shouldn't be desiring. It creates guilt. All these things, and as each one of these comes over the transom, it's like getting lobbed at by psychological bombs over and over and over again, and that creates a trauma. And the news media and reporting and some of the programs, uh, violent programs, just just disgraceful programming is creating more and more and more mental trauma so that people are become dull. They become inured to it. And, and th- th- when you have a traumatized society, what do you do with it? So an example of, of some of this is, you know, we, for those of us that don't watch television and have minimal exposure to media, we end up getting into a much better state of mind. Um, you know, if you go away on a camping trip for two weeks, you come back and you feel pretty good, don't you? And and then you turn on the media or you turn your email on and get back into your social network and you feel kind of this pull-down effect because you were lifted, you were liberated from all that for a while. But what do you do with a society that's become traumatized? Well, the society actually has to make a decision about this. If you're... If, if you were in a dysfunctional family and one member of the family is beating up on the other member of the family, the family has to intervene because the damage is going to be permanent. So society actually has to make a decision on this. And the sooner that we shut this stuff down, the better. You know, we've all heard of ad busters and all these people doing great work. You know, you, you have revolution in the Arab world because they want to shut down dictatorships that are stealing their future. What if you had 10 million people marching to say, no, Fox News should not have a license to broadcast because it lies on the air repeatedly. Why is it able to do this? Because Ronald Reagan repealed a law in 1987 that prohibited lying on the air. So Fox News is trying to get into Canada. And Canada is a little bit of a different country, you know, it, in, in many ways, and you can talk a lot about that, but they've denied them the license because they're basically saying, you know, you lie on the air and you do a lot of other things that are unlawful in our country. You cannot broadcast here. You cannot set up a local station to broadcast here. You're, you're denied. Well, we we as a population, we know that this is happening. We know the damage that they're causing. If you had 10 million people marching on, you know, Fox broadcasting wherever wherever the heck it is, it would shake up a lot of people. It would really shake up a lot of people. If you have citizens deciding, you know, this this is traumatizing, this is damaging, it has to stop. You could actually stop it. Uh, nuclear weapons were stopped. Were stopped. Um, you know, the Arab countries are throwing off dictatorships that have been there for 40 years and you know, Amazing things can happen. We could shut down this kind of media. We could roll it back. We could say, look, you know, television was called the Great Wasteland as, as early as I think the early 60s, right? That was when. But when you, if you turn on a, your, your TV set and watch a program from 1970 and watch the commercials and watch the documentaries and the sitcoms and the news, and then you compare it with what we have now, and, and maybe I'm, a fuddy-duddy here, but I would probably feel a lot better uh, from watching, you know, three hours of TV from 1970, original stuff. It'd be funny, right? It'd be very funny. Slinky toys and macaroni and cheese and Walter Cronkite and all this stuff and Hogan's Heroes, you know. All... But I would have been entertained, fine. And if if you gave me a psych exam after that, you know, I might be different. So why can't we roll back and roll out of some of this stuff and say, it's like bringing the best psychologists we have and say, what is unhealthful? In Singapore, they have laws against this kind of TV. They're very strict controls of what, you know, rampant violence on TV is not allowed in Singapore because they don't want to expose young people, especially to the trauma of the horrors of people being gunned down and all these other terrible things. They just don't allow it, period. What you know, we could, we could, we could roll back that clock. Mm-hmm. One thing that occurs to me is that um, 
television, at least in this country, I mean, we have to sort of talk about it in terms of America, I guess, because it's the, the media monster. <laughs> media monster. But, um, I guess it, 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 to me, is a byproduct of, I mean, it's, it's all owned not by television companies. It's owned by manufacturing companies and, you know, an industrial, mm-hmm. if you will, monster or whatever. GE owns 80% of the media or whatever. So in that sense, how do you stop the it's almost like a tentacle of a bigger beast to me, in a mm-hmm. sense. And I'm wondering mm-hmm. what do you have a perspective on that, and how it's propaganda for something larger, in a sense, you know, and, and a way of life that's lived. This is a hard one to unravel. Mm-hmm. And a colleague of mine, Larry Lessig, who went from fighting the copyright battles, and now he's fighting corruption in government in the U.S., which means the payola that happens between corporations and elected officials, right? That's one of the things you have to unravel, if you can. And they're making some success here. They're making, they're making progress. What they do is they run billboard and radio ads in the districts of Congress people, legislators who, who are in the pay of, say, the medical industry voting against health care reform. And they run these full billboards saying, did you know the person you elected and that promise to do X and that you overwhelmingly support this has been given $3 million by Cigna and is now uh, voting against your legislation and and you have been disenfranchised. And they're doing this. And it's a grassroots grinding day in, day out struggle against this kind of of corruption in government where money is just buying, buying laws. So that's one aspect. I mean, this is a big machine to unravel. But once you get these big combines out of the legislating business, then you can get in and say, you know what? Nobody's allowed to take any campaign money from except for citizens spending $25 or public financing. Boom. All these corporations don't have the same hold. You can run different candidates than you would because they don't need to raise that kind of money. And they're not in the sway of these interests. And suddenly you can change laws and you can regulate and you can get at them from that angle. There are other ways, which is the legal aspect. What if you could prove, and this is all detail here, but what if you could prove that certain television, TV shows, whatever, are causing trauma in people? Then you can approach it from lawsuits and damages. And this is how the cigarette business got regulated and and shut down a lot of places and no, no smoking in public buildings first, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the the law is part of it. Sheer public protest, boycotts, boycotts of these enterprises. Um, you know, continuous, highly organized consumer boycotts. Uh, ways to affect their stock price. Ways to expose individuals within that that organization who are doing hanky panky. And there's plenty of sources for that. These organizations are not all powerful and all seeing and, and perfect. They're full of fallible human beings. They're full of human beings who also don't believe in what the corporation eventually does and it's a mass effect. They don't believe it either. So these things are crumbleable. They're incredibly fallible. So if you attack them, if you decide that General Electric or or Mr. Rupert Murdoch or whatever were the were the problem and the targets, and you you had a pretty well-funded, disciplined, multi-pronged attack, you can gra- gradually whittle it down. Because, you know, a, a mass of two or three million individual citizens is going to move mountains. And we see this in, we saw it in the Arab world, we saw it in governments falling. Um, we saw corporations like uh, the one in India where there was the big chemical spill that, uh, I can't remember, they, they basically went out of business because of lawsuits. You know, and initially that was like, well, we'll just get away with it. And all these people have died. But no, no, Indians hired lawyers and went after, and they basically bankrupted the company. There are ways to bring these titans down. They are absolutely not infallible. Well, that's encouraging. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> they get, they get... And sometimes they bring themselves down, you know, <laughs> yes. to, yeah. as we saw in the financial crisis. You know, like, they brought themselves down. <laughs> Yeah, and and yeah, I mean that corruption corrodes, you know. It corrodes, yeah, and, it, and the judgment is lost, and mm-hmm. and ultimately, um, you know, the truth will out. Mm-hmm. And I think that all these things, all these things that people look at now and they say, "Isn't that terrible?" It seems so obvious to us that this is a terrible thing that's going on, and we think, "Well, 
it's impossible that one day it will come to a head. Well, no, it will, because that this is the nature of how the universe works. Something that is an untruth that goes on and on and on and builds this enormous structure to support itself eventually cannot sustain itself and it comes crashing down. And we keep using like the, like the Soviet Union, but certainly companies that promoted, you know, the sale of cigarettes, you know, they denied for decades that, and they had their paid off scientific stooges, but then the, the, it just couldn't be sustained anymore. It was just the, the link, science found the link, the truth, the truth was out. And those companies, and of course they're expanding their markets elsewhere, but, you know, we don't, uh, airbags, you know, the large, Automakers, you know, will never install airbags. It's too expensive and everything. And, and yet, the carnage on the highways. And if you look at the lives airbags have saved, it's 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 astounding. And now they're all it, because it, the dialogue changed, and the dialogue changed to safety is a value. And of course, for companies like Volvo, that was always the case. And this is why people bought Volvos. But that was one example. But suddenly, around the 80s, 90s, you know, safety became you know, a, a quality, and somebody probably was behind that. There was somebody probably mounted a campaign that made that happen, and and changed the entire industry. And now you've got six or seven airbags in a car, and they're amazingly survivable. Crashes that used to be leave horrendous uh, injury are now very sur- very survival. People walk away. You know, how could anyone, for years, deny that this was necessary? How could anybody do that? But they did, but then it flipped. One day the, the whole situation flipped and we got airbags. And in a sense, humanity needs airbags. You know, the planet needs airbags installed. And, and But I think we're gradually getting them. You know, we talked about what about when we run out of base earth metals, you know. And you can, you can always look, it's the old half empty cup of milk or half, you know, full cup of milk. The... Um, if you say, well, we're running out of palladium and we're running out of all these very valuable things, well, you know, we are, uh, but it's not the sky is falling because guess where those things are? They're in landfills. So come back in the year 2050 and there will be these great machines grinding their way through landfills, which have now become some of the most valuable real estate on the planet. And there are the Google of atoms sorting and searching algorithms as these little bits and pieces of tin can from 1950 and a bit of a palladium from a watch from 1978 and whatever are sorted in high speed through tiny conveyors and big cyclones. And this material is recovered, including the toxic sludge at the bottom, and is all reused. And, and we, you know, we get rid of the landfills and we have this ample source of uh, incredible stuff. We just, we just recycled it. So after the great crescendo, the orchestra and all the voices finish and the, and the sound echoes through the concert hall and we're left with the audiences sitting there thinking, what's next? Well, I think it, it, it really could, it depends on the voices that come through. So if the, the dour oboes are still echoing and playing or the trumpets are sounding, you know, or the harp is playing, or a bit of all of it. So, for example, uh, if if a crescendo ends up with a big dislocation, so we, we have a food problem or we have a psychological problem that, that rolls through the world, then I think that people will humble down a bit. You know, for instance, if you're sitting there watching your plasma TV and getting all hot and lathered about you know, how you hate the other political side and then suddenly the screen blips to dark and there's no power and you come out and there's no power for a month, well, um, you know, the world isn't necessarily going to end because you're going to go back to basics. You're going to say, you know what, that person across the street looks as confused as I do and they voted for the other damn party, but I'm going to go talk to him. I haven't talked to him in two years and... He says, you know, I think there's a problem upstream, and I was a power engineer, and let's sit down and try to figure this out, and and I've got a generator, and we can run part of the neighborhood, and, and people, like here in the Santa Cruz Mountains, when there's this people, 
come together and they solve the problems. And they learn that they're humans and that their neighbors are humans and that they were being fed a line. It's almost like in, in Prague in Eastern Europe, we had the opportunity in the spring of 1990 because I was going to move there and set up a software lab but we got a tour, a walking tour of Prague with this fellow who was uh, in the secret police. Now, given that it was only November of 89 when this regime fell, and the Czechoslovak regime was one of the most absurdly Stalinist, even into that period. And this guy was walking us around Prague, and we stopped by this crowd of people that was looking at some kind of vegematic product, some guy who came in from Germany and set himself up and he was selling appliances, right? Kitchen appliances. And it was all very funny and stupid and kind of whatever, and everyone was completely, all the grandmothers and everyone was looking at this thing that chopped your onions for you, right? <clears throat> and there's a little bit of music playing on the street and everything, and this fellow looked up, he said, my God, it was all wrong. And what he was saying is, Everything that we were telling ourselves was wrong, that the West was waiting at the gates to come in and, and destroy our society, and that they they were dens of iniquity, they were evil, they were this and that, and the communist world was this egalitarian you know, universe, and that we had to sustain ourselves because of this huge enemy, and we were always in fear of them. All they were doing was creating vegematic things to cut up onions, and they were listening to the to the Beatles, and 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 it ended, and none of them came running over the. They came over the border to buy cheap beer, and it was wrong. We we were deluding ourselves. We were being lied to, and I was part of that. So that was a, a coming to truth. That was a crescendo that ended this this end of the Cold War, and and it was gentle. There was no huge nuclear confrontation. Nothing like that happened. So that crescendo ended very positively. The crescendo in South Africa ended positively. Uh, maybe the crescendo in the Arab world, this, this incredibly tight confrontational moment where people want their future is going to end in you know, troubles to come, but I mean, it's ending positively. So I think that w when humanity as a whole hits this crescendo and all our voices are going... We're going to come out of it just as we have in the, the past few times, and we're going to come back to sanity, especially the United States, which just really needs a sanity check. Come back and decide what our principles are. And every generation, all the kids that are connected with Twitter and Facebook and go to the festivals and are part of the same you know, YouTube culture, they're ready to create a world that's one. You know, They are trained, and we're seeing that now. I mean the streets of Cairo or, or Tripoli. I mean, you're seeing this generation is one, and the kids that are here are one with them, and they are talking one-to-one -one with no filters with those people. And uh, right here there was a brief break in the uh, recording where I think that uh, Matt had to uh, change the disk drive or a tape or something like that, and then it, uh, it picks up right here. There are several ways. There's a formula, and there's some good examples of how to roll back the rate of destruction. Uh, one of them, uh, which is pretty primary, and this, this comes from uh, Amory Lovins at the Rocky Mountain Institute. He says, look, if you decided, or if the Chinese government decided, we're going to mandate hybrid vehicles, the whole fleet, everything, you know, in a certain number of years, suddenly... You have lower emission cars all over the world. You've stretched out your supplies of fossil fuels that much. And you probably end up with safer cars and cities are, are healthier to live in. One big change starts with one big mover, happens, huge saving of destruction, a uh, huge amortization into the future. Second thing, um, you decide, and we talked about this earlier, to shut down all the rhetorical, upsetting, tra traumatizing media. We decide we're going to go back to sanity. We do not want, this is what John Stewart was trying to do, get back to sanity. We, we have to remove these voices from the air, and we have to reestablish the laws that we had that said you cannot lie and slander on the air. You just can't. Other countries had them. The United States used to have them. Bring them back. Tone those people down. They're doing a huge amount of damage. 
and that would go worldwide. Some countries don't need this. They've already got this in place, and they already have this. Another one, um, look at this concept, and this may be controversial, but saved births. Uh, China just announced that since 1980, in the establishment of the one child per family policy, they have saved 400 million births. And they celebrate this. Well, why? Because if they had 400 million extra people, China would not have been able to undergo the modernization it has. And it would, it would be like India. It would be 2 billion people plus, and chronic poverty, perhaps famines. They're going all the time, never quite able to pull themselves out. Because of the one-child uh, policy, which most Chinese comply with, you have the parents and all their attention on that one child, all the education going into that one child. The wealth of the families is focused on the inheritance of that one child. You have a buildup of the whole population. Your pressures on the environment are less, on resources and on cities, and everyone's living better. If we had a one-child per family policy or social norm uh, in many parts of the world, especially the developed world, we will reduce the pressures on the future and people will live better in the future. There will be a f fewer people, but they will, live, they will live better. And it could be that some families have two children, but in general, most families are conservative and they try to stay. Maybe they, they have one child and they adopt a child that needs a home. You know, just the right thing to do. That would be an enormous, enormous positive. These are large things. These are very large. Another uh, big positive thing we can do, apart from investing in re renewable energy, which is now happening, it's back since the, you know, the 70s, uh, is look at uh, the food production system. And this has been a focus of your, your film. But what if... You know, outside of buildings now, you have fuel cells, these great cubes that, that sit and they run on, on natural gas and water supplies and they power buildings and they're much cheaper than buying off the grid and it's, it's a fuel cell as it was developed for NASA for use in going to the moon on the shuttle on the space station. What if we develop the technology of the food cell where basic elements come in and you, you think hydroponics or or, or the creation of uh, tofu baths, similar to that. And power comes in, food st uh, uh, stock comes in, and out come foodstuffs. Could it be algae produced? Could it be uh, fermentation of materials, of basic materials to produce things? Cheese is, you know, we, cheese is a food cell product already. Um, bread is a, is a food cell kind of a product. But could we... Could we create such a thing so that you can place this object down and get good quality, uh, no pesticides, herbicides, food produced locally doesn't have to be transported. Uh, you take the if you, you you can grow textured proteins or you can actually grow meat cells. You can take all the cattle off the land. And cattle on the hoof will be a premium type of thing, like an Angus steak will be something that will be expensive because the ranchers are now paying a lot for fuel and people don't want to live that lifestyle. It's damaging to the land anyway. They will still be there, but it'll be a premium business. So the food cell, the coming of this way to make food and to replace highly damaging foodstuffs with much more sustainable, less damaging foodstuffs. And if you go into a grocery store now, you will see substitutes for substitutes for milk, substitutes for meats, substitutes for seafood that used to be caught in the wild. All of these things are re replacement products that are less damaging to the environment and they're easier to produce and they have you know, less toxins in them. And uh, you know, so that, that is a gradual re replacement. And those are many of them are food cell type. They're, they're manufactured. So in bringing this back to all of the, the basics, if you look at the International Space Station, which has just been completed as we sit here, uh, it houses six people. It can house six people long term. They recycle their urine to drinking water. They maintain their air. They're completely self-sustained as far as power, but certainly not foodstuffs. 
and perhaps the next phase for NASA and for the partners of the program is to create this idea of, of what can we do to make food from the matter that's floating around in the station, from trash, from our own wastes. Uh, can we generate edibles and consumables? If they can learn how to do it there, then they can bring the technology here. So in a future, in a bright post-crescendo future, if you have you know, cleaner air, uh, fewer people are... The dystopian vision of the future is a, is a world of 12 billion. You know, we just can't imagine you know, the, the strain that's on the system now and the psychological strain. What if the future is a world of 6.5 billion? It's the same number of people we have now. Isn't this better? Or 5 billion, a little bit of pressure released, released on the environment. The cars are cleaner, the air is cleaner in the cities. We're not in a panic about running out of fossil fuels because we stretched them out and we're just using them better. Um, our, our food supplies are varied and very, very reliable, so no matter what, what climate change does to outdoor agriculture production, our pressure is off the seas, so the seas are bouncing back and fish populations are coming back. Um, and because there are a few, fewer births, we're focusing a lot more on kids. Um, we focus on their education, and we also focus on them on protecting them from trauma from media. So we've cut that out. We said, you know what? These programs, you can, you can study them in college. They'll be part of a, you know, trauma media studies, you know, 101, where you can actually watch these things, but they're kind of put away in the vault because... And anybody who hasn't seen these shows and never been raised with them watches a television show of, you know, 2011 and says, oh, my God, I can't even, I have to turn it off. I can't, I cannot, I, you know, I'm mesmerized, but I have to turn away because this thing is so upsetting. Because if you haven't been desensitized to this and you watch this and, and you're horrified by what you're seeing, you're horrified by an ordinary television commercial of 2011. So they're kept in a vault as an example of what not to do to a, to, a, to a society. And so all of those things are gone. And you have, you know, a world that's maybe a little bit like Denmark, you know, <laughs> with the windmills going and the, the sanity of the population. Uh, you, know, you know, it's, you, there are places that you can go that are like this already, that perhaps are living in this more positive, balanced, post-crescendo world. I mean, Europe is an example, Scandinavia, etc. There are places that are already there. The future is already happening. You know, Denmark is aiming at 20, 25% of their power from wind, you know, within a, a generation. And they, they will do it. And they have, they have Jutland, you know, they're going to do it because they have the wind. Um, but th these these places exist. There's Curitiba in Brazil. There's Hyderabad in India. There are these model cities that really work. You know, under tough circumstances of shanty towns and people migrating in, they're, they're, the cities are well architected enough and have these innovative ways of trading trash for transit tickets. And so the people then become mobile who are in the shanty towns, and then they find jobs. And there, there are people who are really designing intelligently to support the populations. You know, what's interesting in, in Thailand, you know, Thailand's a, a great example because Thailand has had a population explosion. Uh, we went to Thailand with a friend of ours from years ago who was there in the Peace Corps, 1971. He took us to the point in Bangkok where the edge of the town used to be. We had to drive like an hour from where we were in built-up Bangkok in toward the city to find the, the edge of town in 1971. And it's shocking when you think of it. But the king of Thailand, who's a revered leader, his whole thing was long-term thinking. He said, we need to improve every sector of our society by a couple of percent a year in, in measurable improvement. That goes from water quality to the children's education and literacy, every sector must grow and improve, but we also have to keep ahead of our population growth. And they've done it. I mean, Thailand, you know, the the canals are are cleaner than they were, and, and all around them was raging wars. 
you know, there was the this, the Vietnam War on one side and Cambodia, and then you had Myanmar and Burmese juntas and generals on the other. But Thailand developed and grew and grew and grew because of this long-term thinking and orchid projects to royal projects, you know, to help displaced people and, and hill tribes people to the development of different industries, the jewelry industry, the electronics industry. It was all done with some thinking. Now, of course, Thailand has problems. It has political problems and et cetera, et cetera, but it really has come a long way, you know, in, in those, since the dark days of the Southeast Asian wars. And they just did it incrementally. One thing that comes to mind when you're talking about this technology that will help manage and improve things, a lot, a lot of it has to do with, um, some like re- changing regulations, saying we can't have destructive media, we can't have these sorts of things. But it, it, to me, it seems like that's going to happen if there's a participatory democracy. If there's a p- participation mm-hmm. in this regulation coming from society itself, and I feel like, at least in this country, particularly, but probably most other places in the world too, there's there's tactics of coercion, of intimidation, of panic, brainwashing, all these things that have allowed the population to not seize and take control of their destiny and and maybe there's something about that dynamic you can say from traveling around the world you've seen. is there yeah the the <laughs> level to which people participate in their own governance and their own lawmaking you know certainly varies all over the world but what it really comes down to is just a small group there's a small group of people who are manipulating the levers of power and doing what we would consider disenfranchising or not positive productive behavior because they're feathering their own nests and they're they're doing things at the expense of others but there is usually a small group of people who are opposing them and it's it's the drama that plays out on the stage of these two groups and the rest of us are pretty much just sitting eating our popcorn or not paying attention because frankly I mean it's a lot of energy it takes a lot to to engage in that so Larry Lessig and his group at you know Change Congress or Fix Congress, they're fighting corruption in the U.S. political system by saying, you can't, you know, use payola. You can't go and uh, if you are a big industrial combine X, go and buy a politician to get a law change because you're disenfranchising the population that may or may not have elected that person, and you're you're uh, wrecking the future for your own short-term gains. And so he's one very smart guy with a very dedicated group that has entered that stage and saying, we're, gonna, we're using all the tactics we know. We're going to run billboard campaigns in your district. We're going to run radio commercials, and we're going to hit you right at home to say, well, you accepted $3 million from this large health care company to vote against the health care reform that your constituents actually voted you in to enact and you're just you know you're engaging in a crime which is what this is and so those people have the power and if they have a little more support from the public you know if there were if there was a rally on Washington and for something like an abstract thing like payola and government I mean I think some people would turn out for it if there were three million people Marching on Washington behind Larry Lessig would make an impression. It doesn't have to be the whole population. Boycotts, consumer boycotts, massively effective on companies. You have no idea the the, the panic that is induced by stockholders and board members if they think that this is happening. The power of new media. There was a woman who who had a, a, a Maytag, I don't know if you heard this, she had a Maytag washer, right? And she had 40,000 followers on Twitter. She was just a very good Twitter person. And her Maytag experience was so poor. You know, we, we have all seen the ads, like the Maytag repairman has, has, has nothing to do because these things never break. Well, she Twittered this whole thing for weeks about trying to get her, her laundry is piling up. You know, and and all these people, she basically she wrecked the Maytag brand in about you know a month, and that they didn't even know where this was coming from. And suddenly they they have this incredibly bad reputation. So the power of this media and the power of an ordinary person 
that gets a following to, to move things. And we see this in Egypt. We'll see this more and more. We'll just say, suddenly there's a person who, through tweets, has brought down a big thing or brought down a politician or something. Now, of course, there will be a lot of noise there and there will be a lot of false positives. I mean, you remember the BP oil spill, the guy that got the Twitter address that was like BPPR America or something. And then he was putting out these statements about BP and people thought it was the official BP feed, right? And But he actually shifted this whole dialogue. He shifted, he, he woke up BP in some way that, you know, he was making statements that everyone thought BP was being insensitive. So he would Twitter, tweet something that, of course, we're insensitive. You know, we're a large oil company and, you know, <laughs> what do you, what do you expect? So, you know, this, this is the wild card. This is the joker in the, in the hand that we're going in the future with this power to move. And, and this is the power outside of the corporate controlled media. Now, this has been talked about for, you know, 15, 20 years now, but we see it again and again and again happening. And so you can have your Fox News and you can have, and I, I lumped the, you know, the left, the left wing in with this too. Uh, people who, anyone who basically uh, characterizes another group of people in some way and also uses panic, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, FUD, the FUD factor, People who are using that technique, I lump them all together. And it's not to be if they're left, right, right wing, center. It doesn't really matter. It, what really matters is real experience of people on the ground, on the street, and their lives. That's what matters the most because that's the reality and that's what the future we're going to live in is, are those people. So if somebody is, is tweeting and saying, you know, I, I'm, in desperate, I'm in a desperate circumstance, I've been foreclosed, uh, my, you know, you have no idea what this is like, and suddenly you get this one tweet in the wilderness, and it blows away all of the reporting and all of the mumbo jumbo about, you know, financial this and that. The, what really matters is what happened to this person and the the pain that they're going through. So, for example, a story about I've been foreclosed and you know I'm, I my life is ruined. That person gets angry enough, they could create a movement, and that the power of those words of that I've been foreclosed, and the anger is directed all over the place. But there's also a productive, if there's a productive aspect to it, like I don't ever want to get into a circumstance where I'm in in having to pay a mortgage for 30 years. It makes no sense. One, I'm 60 years old, and and two, this whole system just doesn't work. It's a, a system of usury to extract money out of people. We need to invent a new way to house ourselves. We learned our lesson. We're not going to go back into this again. And so that could start a movement of alternative housing, of alternative financing of housing. And when I went to Eastern Europe in the early 90s, I explained to people this idea of mortgages and they thought I was crazy. They said, you're crazy. Why would you indenture yourself like a slave to make these payments which seem to be pretty high to this organization and they take all the interest in the beginning and you're, you're able to deduct that, but big deal. And you, you work for 15, 20, 30 years and because you have to move, you never get it paid off, you always go to another place. Why would anybody sign up for that program? And I said, well, how do you get a home? Well, we have some land left by our grandparents. We go looking for bricks. <laughs> And the fellow that, that, that I stayed with in near Prague, he had this dog-eared handyman's book of how to build a house that had been passed around probably to about 300 people. And he read it cover to cover. It was in English, actually, English and German. And then he learned from that book how to build a house, and it took them 15 years <laughs> because there was no building supplies stores or nothing like that. You actually stole it from the government construction sites and things like this. Now, that's not a way to get into a house either, but it's, in a sense, it's better because the people build it themselves and they, they were not, it wasn't a thing of usury. So somebody could change the world just by tweeting their story. And if it's a powerful story and people organize around it, 
But then there's there can't just be protest. It can't be like the 60s. You can't be just against. You have to find out what you are for, not just what you are against. That's the key to this to getting through the crescendo. So there's one instrument that's left at the end that has a positive note. Hmm. That's great. <laughs> That makes me think, um, maybe one more question before we uh, take a break, but I, uh, <clears throat> it makes me think about the, this Buckminster Fuller quote saying that in his lifetime, the, the literacy rate had, had gone, uh, I forget by what fold, but basically when he was born, almost nobody was literate. And in mm-hmm. his lifetime, um, you know, the majority of the population of the planet is literate. And that removed the need for managers and religious Priests, leaders and, yeah. and, and all of these th- people, these roles that we've lived with for thousands and thousands of years. Is that what we're seeing now as a transition from now people are educated enough or able to educate each other and themselves enough where we don't need these leaders leading a blind mass? Is that something I, you think? Is- I think we are seeing that. We are seeing, you know, it's Timothy Leary's old adage, you know, don't trust authority, think for yourself. Now, of course, what you see, this is this mass effect of people who who can become wise to things. They become wise to the tricks of the commercial world, the propaganda world and the commercial world. So they don't quite buy that. They're empowered. They work as a freelance agent at home, so they learn how to run themselves as a business. They're not tied to a job. Or no, they know that they can go from startup to startup. It's a little bit less stable a life, but it's more empowering. They're more of a pioneer. They're empowered all over the place. They could be a minority, they're empowered. They're a female, they're empowered. They're a kid, they're empowered. They have more communication tools in their hand at age 15 than NASA's engineers in, in mission control in 1969. You know, this kid is carrying around a, a way to get information from a global data bank. That's empowerment. That's a tremendous empowerment. So what I think you're seeing is, you know, in the most positive view, the the death rattle of those who used to enforce by hegemony. So the death rattle of uh, religion, all all controlling religion. You see this in the Catholic Church. You know, in the scandals that. Whole countries have risen up and said there was abuse. This this organization traumatized the whole population and throwing it off, changing laws, bankrupting the dioceses. You know this is a major change, and so the Catholic Church is having to finally adapt. You know, and this is a very top-down organization. Um, so, you know, yes, and so the 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 noise level, the, the shrill pitch of the former hegemonists is reaching a fever pitch because it's you, you're completely losing control. Um, and, of course, at the same time, you have conspiracy theory. Now, what's interesting thing about conspiracy theory is that is actually part of disempowerment as well. So you get this marriage between those who believe the most bizarre things, which, which the conspiracy theorists, their ultimate... Their ultimate belief system is that you have these all-powerful, top-down, secretive organizations that have done, that run the world, and have done all these these almost impossible feats. They, in a sense, are hearkening back to a time that never was, perhaps, when there were more all-powerful organizations that controlled top-down, like the Soviet Union which it really was able to control the information. It took enormous energy, so much energy that the whole thing crumbled. But they're hearkening back to these mythical times. Uh, and in a sense, the conspiracy theorists, I believe in a sense they hope that this is true. Because, of course, if it's not, then they're made out to be fools. You know, the largest fools, you know, turn your barrier backside for a little paddle because this is... You've just made an incredible fool of yourself if this is not true. Um, so they are, in a sense, hoping for this to be. But then on the other side, you have the demagogues and the media people uh, struggling to come to terms with the fact that they can't control the situation. Nobody is in control. And they're scre- they, what they are doing is they're raising the level to a fever pitch, the, the dialogue, the, the voice level, because the whole system is is so out of control 
that they feel in a grave state of panic. So in some sense, the conspiracy theorists and those on the other side that would like to create the conspiracies are our partners, in a sense. And, but we, I hope and wish that it is a death rattle because these, we just don't need either of this. this. We, we need none of the, They're very destructive. Yeah, most definitely. Um, but but then it, you sort of uh, the, the address for a second that there's a, something about mythologizing or hearkening back to this other time. So it also seems like, in a sense, uh, what is the mythology we're entering? What is the, the new mythology that is not the listening to the preacher at the pulpit or whatever? What is the new the mythology, mythology of our culture then? It, well, how does it... What because we we will have to have a myth I would assume or a mythology to some degree. What what do you think would be the change between the old? I think sitting here on the west coast of North America, where we're of course we're like Manhattanites. You know, there's that famous poster of Manhattan that shows Manhattan. You know, Central Park, Fifth Avenue, whatever. And there's a sliver of New Jersey, and then there's two palm trees, and that's California. And then there's like a blob saying Asia. <laughs> You know, this is the New Yorker's view of the world. So sitting out here in, you know, the edge of the West, um, we think of uh, the crescendo, the post-crescendo, the, the emerald civilization. That's what you might call it. It's sort of the, the emerald civilization, the azure and emerald civilization, where you have clean air and water, where you have, you know, people. Um, it's It's almost like, if taken to extremes, the Navi and Avatar are living in harmony with nature and having a little bracelet where it connects them with the net so that they can both live in a high-tech world but live with very much planted on the ground. I mean, those are very ex- extreme visions. But I think every every one of us grew up with science fiction films showing electric cars and happy socialized people in you know wearing funny jumpsuits you know in these 70s and 60s uh, sci-fi or 80s sci-fi and we think of it it's calm and there's no no wars and there's you know maybe no no currency and everybody gets food by you know putting their finger on a on a glass plate or you know who knows all these the federation of star trek and whatnot I think that's probably pretty un- unrealistic, but I think that the, the trend, certainly the trend is that uh, all over the world, I mean, you fly, you know, I've been to China pretty frequently. You go to China and the media would have you think that, you know, you're entering this place of uh, gulags and uh, slave labor camps and everything, and that's the last thing, I mean, Certainly, maybe that's there, but when you go to China, you see 24, 25, 26-year-old bright faces where they're, they're learning constantly. The, pop, the working population is very low. Everyone helps everyone else. You go through security at the airport, and it's far nicer than here. There are never any lines at airports. They have 60 security desks to check the passport. 60 in parallel. You just choose the one you want. When you have the numbers, people are polite, they're uh, courteous, um, and this level of service is higher. The aircraft, the interiors are better. The food preparation and presentation is better. Um, the positivity of the people is, is there. Um, you know, certainly they live differently, but their attitude is, is so refreshing. It's almost like, to some extent, when you go from the United States to Canada, you find the same thing. Mm-hmm. You find this refreshing, oh, thank goodness, I'm out of that pall. I'm into a place where there are no, no fighter jets in the skies and no screaming people on TV and where there's a health care system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to some extent, the future is being made around us. The future is in little places like Canada, or big places like Canada. It's in, it's in the bright eyes of of a girl in in China who's trying to learn English and she's working in a hotel and you connect with her and you you give her information about a school and then you give her a hundred dollars and that pays for her entire school you know for for learning English I mean that's a future that's a crescendo future I go to Pakistan you know Pakistan is a hot zone you know Pakistan in the media is you know, is the is is Armageddon, you know, happening? 
I go to Pakistan because I work with a company that has software engineers. There's over 200 software engineers in Islamabad. And it's amazing. These people are profoundly good at what they do. Many of them are devout Muslims, but they're, they're Twitter Muslims. You know, they're very high tech. They're not proselytizing the religion. They're simply good human beings. They, their religion gives them strength. It gives them work ethic. It gives them clarity of deciding what's good and bad. It's all the good things that religion are giving them. They're engineers, sure, but for every one of them that's working in software, there are 60 or 70 people that benefit. So their immediate family, the family in the village, etc., that one salary benefits all those people. They are at the forefront of helping a very troubled part of the world move into a positive future. They're building products that are used by Swiss banks, they're used by the you know, Library of Congress. They're proud of their work. It's world-class work, and it's being exported all over the planet. So even from a place like, like Pakistan, there's this goodness. There's this cycle of goodness that's going on. So the future of Pakistan is being made in little pieces of Pakistan. And you know, just have to recognize that. You know, we talked about South Africa. We talked about Brazil, about India. And to some extent, one of the biggest places where the big problems are is the United States. You're listening to the Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. And I'm going to have to agree with Bruce that some of the biggest problems holding back a more promising future right now are to be found right here in the United States. But uh, I'm going to let you chew on that for yourself and uh, see what you come up with. Personally, uh, one of the main things I'm taking away from uh, what Bruce just said is that, and I quote, to some extent, the future is being made around us, unquote. And uh, if you're a regular over at the growreport.com forums or uh, on the Virtual Vapor Lounge or the Dope Tribe's new international online call-in radio program, Planet London Radio, which you can find over at Justin TV, J-U-S-T-I-N dot TV, well, then you're already well aware of the conversations buzzing all around the planet where the future is not only being created, but is also looking like it can actually be quite enjoyable once we get through this great shift that is now underway, or as Bruce says, the great crescendo. Also, uh, I hope that if you can, you'll be attending the Breaking Convention Psychedelic Conference that's being held at the University of Kent at Canterbury in the UK this coming weekend. Although I can't get there myself, I'm sure that we'll not only have some first-hand reports about the conference, but uh, that the organizers may also be able to uh, maybe send us a few recordings of some of the talks that uh, we can play here in the salon. And if uh, you're like me, you aren't in a position to do much traveling right now, but still want to engage in the personal dialogue with some of the people you've heard here in the salon, well... We're going to experiment with something that uh, you could think of as a, maybe a delayed Q&A session with them. Now, should this actually take off and be a big hit, I'll, of course, uh, claim credit for it myself. However, the truth of the matter is that this was actually Bruce Damer's idea, and uh, I personally think that it's an excellent step in the right direction, namely, finding the others and hearing their voices. Now, our working name for this new format is a global trialogue. And here's how we think it could work. The idea is that uh, each topic begins with a question from you or one of our other fellow saloners. And the most direct way to ask your question is to go uh, to Bruce's website, damer.com, D-A-M-E-R.com, and then scroll down to the bottom of the page and click the link labeled Contact. And that will take you to a comment form that Bruce personally checks every day. Also, I plan on starting a thread on the Psychedelic Salon forum over at thegrowreport.com, which uh, is the most friendly and flame-free site I know of. And I'll pass those questions on to Bruce as well. Now, for the questions that we picked to trialog, we hope that uh, we can get you to record your questions so that your voice is added to the salon as well. And if that can't be arranged, we'll have somebody read it for you. And from your question, Bruce will proceed, and hopefully we'll be able to find some sound bites from previous podcasts where another speaker also had something relevant to say about your question. And with luck and a little editing, I think we can even use multi-part questions. In fact, they may even be the best way to go if we really want to make it feel like a trialogue. Now, we've already received two interesting questions that we'll begin with, and we're hoping that this will grow into a frequent and regular feature of the salon. 
I've only mentioned this uh, briefly in passing over at the Grow Report forums and uh, on another uh, thread, actually, and that's where the first questions came from. Interestingly, uh, one of the comments was uh, something along the lines of fearing that Bruce maybe would get too many geek questions and that may detract from the direction of the past programs. Well, I think I have an answer for that as well. So if you really want to geek out with a question and it doesn't seem to work here in the salon, I also have another podcast channel that I began several years ago. However, uh, I only got around to producing one program for it. (laughs) And you can uh, find that at www.matrixcast, all one word, matrixcast.com. And uh, there you'll find a podcast of a long conversation that Bruce and I had uh, back in 2007 when we were on this farm together. And uh, one of my favorite quotes from uh, that conversation is, Stars are temporary interruptions in dust's normal life cycle of just hanging around. (laughs) Nice thought, huh? So if you have a question that you'd like to ask Bruce, uh, please go to damer.com and let us hear from you. Also, uh, hey, let's not forget that this coming Sunday, April 3rd, is what has come to be known as Terence Day, when we celebrate the life and work of the Bard McKenna, who left the planet on that day in the year 2000. Hmm, now that I think of it, uh, it seems just like yesterday when that happened, and yet, how can 11 years have gone by since then? Hmm. Anyway, uh, I know that on that day, Bruce will be hosting a gathering at his farm when friends and fans of Terence get together each year. And for my part, I'll be calling in to justin.tv slash Planet London Radio, which airs from 7 p.m. till midnight in London time and 5 to noon here in Southern California. And that's uh, this Sunday, April 3rd. It's really a great place to hook up with some of the people you know from the forums and uh, from some of the great podcasts over at dopefiend.co.uk, where uh, I'm proud to admit that I'm also a member of the Dope Tribe myself and uh, I hope that you can join us for what has now become a regular Sunday event. In closing today, I'd like to pass along an interesting thought that I heard this past week and uh, follow that with a song titled Don't You. And uh, it was written and is performed by my friend and our fellow saloner, Encore. Now the thought is something that my teacher said the other day and it has really caused me to do some serious thinking about myself. It goes like this. Ultimately, There are two things that human beings never regret about their lives. One is having had courage, and the other is being themselves and not someone else. As simple as that sounds, it uh, can hold profound implications for you, or at least it did for me. You see, when I think of courage, I don't necessarily think of somebody running into a burning building and saving a child or something like that. To me, that's heroism, and it uh, is something different from courage, which... Again, uh, for me, maybe not for you, but for me it implies a serious thought process as opposed to an immediate response to a critical situation. To me, courage means getting up on a cold winter morning and going to school, no matter how irrelevant it may seem at the time. Courage can be found in the people who each day go to a job that they hate, but they need in order to fulfill some financial obligations they have or to support a family that may not even appreciate their sacrifice. But you do it anyway because it's the right thing for you to do at the time. There are a lot of ways to display courage in your life. And the second part is even more elusive, being true to yourself. I once had a friend who is much like the character Ricky in Trailer Park Boys, the uh, -the off-the-wall comedy series out of Newfoundland that came out a few years back. My friend once said, Everybody wants to be like me, but nobody wants to be around me. Well, that's not what I call being true to yourself. In my book, it's uh, just being called a jerk. Not that we haven't all been attracted to big jerks from time to time. It happens to all of us. But being true to yourself holds a different meaning for each and every one of us. And I actually have no advice as to how it can be done. For me, I just try to be the best me I can and try not to please everybody, just myself. And with all of my faults, biases, and incomplete and bad information... I find myself constantly adjusting to find the right balance between being true to my inner picture of who I am and not being an inconsiderate jerk in the process. It's a fine line indeed, and not one that I always succeed in walking. But I try, and I'm sure that you do too. So, have courage, my friend, and be the best you possible. Thank you. 
This is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends. <laughs>